privileged to be able to come to you today and share with you the uh, burdens of my heart and share with you a message that I believe God has placed on my heart, a message that I believe will uh, mean something to you in your own personal life, a message that God has used to just literally liberate me in some areas. And so in a few moments we will be sharing this particular message. And I wonder if you would just bow with me for a word of prayer. If you're where you can bow and pray, if you, of course you're not, uh, that you can just pray along with us as you're driving or whatever. And so pray with us, please. Father, in Jesus' name, we come. We ask you for that anointing that we need at this time to be able to share this message with these people in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I would like to say this to you in relationship to some things that have been happening. Many of you have um, become very serious prayer warriors over these past months. I'm sure that uh, to you that have really been praying, uh, you would uh, you will be delighted to know exactly what the Lord is doing in my behalf. Of course, most of you that are on this uh, tape ministry are aware that uh, for now five years this uh, well, last month, really, five years ago last month, I got up from what most people considered a deathbed and began to travel around over the country in a, a continuation of an itinerant ministry. And I want you to know these five years have not uh, been without their reward, and God has uniquely blessed many, uh, many, many of the times that... Uh, I would go to meetings, I would have to pray that the Lord would give me the strength to even get in the pulpit. And then when I would get in the pulpit, of course, the glory of God would come, and we were able to see uh, mighty things accomplished over these past five years. These past five years stand as an outstanding history of the sufficiency of Jesus in human flesh. And I can certainly praise the Lord for all of these five years. I um, look back and I feel that a great deal of the strength that I have received has come from people that have shared in my ministry. And of course, when I talk about sharing in my ministry, I'm not necessarily talking about a financial sharing. I'm talking about a spiritual uh, prayer uh, experience where people have literally been led of God to pray when I wasn't even asking for their prayers. And this has been quite an experience. Well, as we have moved along in these five years, the emphasis has moved from one point to the other as the need have uh, come up, you know, in the churches and so on. But uh, the ministry has continued to grow. And as the Lord... Uh, has challenged us at some points we have backed off. I feel that uh, on some occasions I have backed off from some of the things God wanted me to do. And I do feel that the reason for my backing off was simply a lack of real, genuine, vital faith in the Lord. But, uh, of course, I excused uh, my backing off to the fact that I wasn't capable of doing these things health-wise, and so on and so forth. But, of course, all during these years, in fact, for many years, I have had a, a real genuine burden and a genuine concern about the fact of getting the message of uh, salvation and victory to the lives of those people who really count, like, you know, the preacher and the staff member and the leaders of the church. And I have felt all along that the Bible conference approach, of course, is the key to this uh, ministry. It's the key to my ministry. It's what God wants me to do in my uh, day. And, of course, back before I got ill, I was greatly involved in, in uh, Bible conferences and 
And so, of course, since that time, I've been greatly involved in Bible conferences. But all during those days, even since I have been up from the hospital, I've basically worked through men, worked through men. In uh, other words, I just helped men do what they felt like God wanted them to do. And, of course, they were sharing the vision that I shared, and there was no uh, controversy between us in our vision, so why shouldn't we? But as the years have moved along, and especially the last couple years, uh, I keep sensing that the Lord is telling me uh, to um, move out in a conference work, more specifically under my direction. And, of course, I have just simply said, why, why, why? and have somewhat rebelled at that. But this year, in the last three months, God has really shut me up to himself. And, of course, I've discussed this with men I work with, like Jack Taylor, Ron Dunn, T.D. Hall, just a number of great men of God, and I've discussed this matter with them. But I, nevertheless, I've just been shut up to the Lord. In fact, I have been shut up to such circumstances that I would have to deliberately reject the plan of God not to go on in the light of, of this conference ministry. But this year, uh, God got me to the place where I just simply told him that I was willing. And since then, conferences have opened up all over the country. We have uh, invitations now even to Europe. And, of course, uh, the invitations have been coming all along for meetings uh, here in the United States. But, of course, we've turned most of those meetings to uh, revival meetings rather than a conference-type approach. But, nevertheless, the Lord is giving uh, wisdom at this point now, and, and the surrender has been made, and things are really happening. And, of course, we haven't got all the uh, formation of the structure of the work laid out yet as to uh, under what name or title or our uh, emphasis we will uh, be able to uh, project, you know, and so on. But the Lord, nevertheless, is showing us that uh, his ministry for us in our day in relationship to revival in these last days, is it's to be carried out in this fashion. So this is a new challenge to me. It's a new uh, insight to me. It's a new uh, experience for me. And I just want you to pray that the Lord will have his way. Now, in the light of all this, we've asked the Lord to uh, send us some help in the office. We've needed someone here in this office. And, of course, uh, I've talked to several people. In fact, uh, we talked to one young lady in Maryland that uh, that's a precious Christian friend. And, and I thought maybe that she might be the one, but... Uh, Somehow that did not work out, and and so I was just at the end of the rope, and so I said, Lord, now you've you've put a work on my heart, you left me here for this purpose, and now you aren't planning on taking me to heaven right away, it seems, and if we if I go, we're all going to go, and so you you've left me here with a work to do. Now I've got to have some help, and so the Lord challenged me to just trust him for a secretary. And, of course, in these last few months, boy, this matter of really trusting Jesus has become genuinely alive in my own heart and life. And so um, I began to be challenged to trust the Lord for a secretary. So I looked in um, the Word for a word, and the Lord began to speak to my heart out of Exodus 31.3. There Moses had, of course, a work cut out for him to do, himself to do. God had given him a work to do. And he was in need and the Lord said, I've got a man here. He said, he's filled with the Spirit. The Spirit has given him knowledge and wisdom and and so on. And, uh, and the Lord enabled me to claim that promise. And I want and just, you know, I want you to know just in a matter of, uh, of weeks the Lord began to open the door for a young lady to come and work with us. Uh, of Someone that that certain, certainly is filled with uh, knowledge of God, the wisdom of God, and the ability that I need in this office. And so it just uh, has blown my mind. So you be praying for this young lady.
because as she comes, uh, we have got to determine on what method or what approach or is she going to work. In other words, is she going to be able to trust the Lord some for her finances or am I going to be uh, the one to trust the Lord for her total finances and so on? So you pray. Her name is uh, Barbara, B-Y-E-R-S. And uh, you just uh, pray for Barbara that the Holy Spirit might uh, really anoint her and use her in this office because uh, she certainly is gifted, but with all your gifts, you cannot be used as the Lord wants you to unless the Holy Spirit anoints you. So you pray for her as she comes. Now, the Lord has blessed in so many other ways that I just uh, can't mention today. But uh, as I see it, the Lord is uh, changing uh, revival meetings into conferences, and and we're going to see a great deal of emphasis uh, in the meetings on conferences. And these conferences will take on uh, a significant turn to the meeting of the needs of uh, the uh, leaders. And I know that the Lord would have you to pray for us about this matter, so you pray that the Lord will speak to your heart uh, and just tell you when to pray and how to pray for us. And we'll praise the Lord for that. And so, now you pray with us as we get into the message today because I believe this message is a message that can turn your life into victory. Well, if there's anything that is uh, certain today, it's the fact that... uh, Everything about us seems to be uncertain. And because um, everything about us is so uncertain, uh, everyone seems to be confused and not knowing where to go and what to do and what to be. And so today, as I share with you this message that's on my heart, I want to talk to you about the matter of certainty. Now, some time ago, I was faced with a problem, and I was talking to a friend, and of course this friend loves Jesus and saved, genuinely saved, and in fact he sold out to Jesus and walking with Jesus. But as I discussed this problem, I said, you know, the Lord has allowed the devil to uh, get into this thing to speak to me for some reason, in some way, somehow God wants to speak out of this. And this person uh, responded in the ways uh, by simply saying, well, you know, that problem, he, he said, I don't think you should attribute it to God or the devil, but you just should say it's just uh, part of red tape. You know, it's just all confused because of just simple uh, red tape. And, uh, and you know, I began to think about that, and I almost said, I said, oh, no. I said, you know, everything is, is uh, in order and it's uh, for a purpose, and it's uh, allowed with something in mind. There's no such thing as an accident or good luck or bad luck. I almost said that, but I didn't. And then after the phone call uh, or the conversation, I I began to think about that, and I began to think about what Miss Bertha Smith said one time when she heard someone say, well, you know, we sure did have a streak of good luck. And she said, well, to use the word luck or good luck or bad luck is to use the language of a heathen. And I got to thinking about that and, and I began to search my heart about it and begin to look into something of the different concepts of man and what are the va- basic philosophies that man live by or what's the basic philosophy of man, I should say, uh, that uh, it, that's revealed by man's actions. And I found this. I found that uh, man believes in three basic theories of uh, thought. One, number one, is the theory of contingency. The theory of contingency. And then number two is the theory of fatalism. And number three is the theory of certainty. Now, I want to take these three theories and just look at them for just a moment with you, please. First of all, the theory of contingency. 
Now, if you go to your Webster Dictionary, you'll find that the word contingency uh, relates to the matter of accident or uh, things just uh, are loose and they accidentally get together. And people believe in the theory of contingency a great deal more than you believe, that everything is just by chance, it's just accidental. There's no form to it, there's no order to it, there's no purpose to it, that it's just uh, loose and it's just floating around here and there, and therefore things just accidentally happen. Then there is the theory of fatalism. Of course, fatalism is a theory that there, everything is absolutely so ordered, that it's so structured, that... Uh, Man couldn't change it if he wanted to. Man couldn't have any part in it if he wanted to. And, of course, uh, what is to be will be, and there's no other way out of it. There's no other hope. There's no other possibility. And so there is the, the thought of fatalism. There, and, you know, a lot of people believe in this thought of fatalism. And then there is the thought of certainty. Now, Certainty carries with it the idea of absolute or truth, something real, something uh, unshakable, something unchangeable. And so we have the theory of certainty. Now, of course, um, man lives in some measure of all three of these. Some measure of all three of these. But the man that does not know Jesus Christ and does not accept Jesus Christ on the basis of the authority of the Word of God is a man, of course, that is at loose at all ends. And, of course, if he even believes in the theory of certainty... He derives his belief about certainty from facts that science has, uh, you know, handed down. And science itself does not believe in the theory of certainty because the points of which they draw their conclusion is not based upon a fact that is absolutely certain because they derive at their conclusions with... Uh, means of logic, research and so forth, uh, that could not be basically true because the premises of their origin is wrong from the very beginning. But now the man who believes in Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who accepts the authority of the Word of God, he derives to his, at his point of certainty from the very beginning of the truth and that truth is the Word of God. That's the basis. That's the premises uh, whereby he initiates all of his search and thereby comes to all of his conclusions. So actually we have a um, Christian is a man that is derived at the position of certainty and he's derived at that position of certainty on the basis of the eternal Word of of God. Now, uh, as we come to this, Christians that have come to accept the fact of the Word of God as the authority, and uh, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and the facts in the Word of God is the truth of God. <coughs> Excuse me. This man, this man, of course, having come to know the Lord, having come to uh, no, the Lord can still vacillate back and forth to these different other two uh, theories, the, the theory of uh, contingency and the theory of fatalism. They can vacillate back and forth because uh, they're free to think as they will. But uh, as they vacillate back and forth, they become more confused as to what's going on because God certainly deals on the basis of the absolutes, the certainties. 
And so, as we look at this, uh, I want to discuss with you something that is absolutely certain, a theory of certainty. Now, of course, uh, the, uh, the idea of certainty is established in the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, virgin born, heaven sent, literally was born, literally lived, literally died, literally resurrected, lived, literally lives on high, and so on. And there's a thousand different certainties in the Bible. But God has one for us today to discuss, and I want to discuss that certainty. Now, as I come to discuss this certainty, I want to uh, get you to turn, if you were, you can. Of course, some of you may be riding down the road, flying in a plane or something else. But if you were, you can. I want you to turn with me to the book of Psalms, and we will turn to the 77th chapter. Psalm 77, and in that psalm, we have the psalmist, obviously in a rather dejected condition. He seems to be very disturbed about his condition. He uh, seems to be crying out unto the Lord, and he indicates in the second verse that is uh, that he's all under trouble uh, night and day and that uh, his trouble is genuinely with him. And in this awful, dejected, despondent condition, we have him responding to the Lord, and he said, I'll remember God, and I'll remember what he's uh, done. And he begins to remember the great times of the Lord. He begins to remember what God has done for the children of Israel. And um, it seems that the psalmist is recalling all the blessed moments when God miraculously worked in the life of the or the history of the children of Israel. And he considered those days, and he considered his time in relationship to those days when God mightily, mightily blessed the children of Israel. He, he here finds himself saying that at the very presence of God, the water fled. And obviously he's making reference to the very presence of God at the uh, Red Sea, on the banks of the Red Sea, the very water fled from the very presence of God. And so we see him here as he thinks back, reflects back upon those great moments with God. But remember, he's still dejected. He's still despondent. He's still under the uh, load of this thing or whatever it is. And um, as he remembers those great works of the Lord, all at once he breaks in with a truth that's absolutely uh, confounding, and it's certainly a certainty, and that is this. He says, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary, in that 13th verse. You see, as he ponders and looks over the past and sees himself in this very dejected condition, it seems like that he is uh, searching to know the way. He's searching to know the way. And I do not know the depth of his need, but I do know that he is in need here. And he's in need to know the way. And so, right out of all of this darkness, as he declares his position of darkness and he remembers those past days, he breaks in at that 13th verse and he says, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Now, here's what I want you to see. I want you to read that verse like this. And best I can understand, that will, this will not do an injustice to that verse. Thy way, O God, is in thy presence. Thy way, O God, is in thy presence. There you have it. There you have the psalm seeing that thy way, O God, is in thy presence. Now there is a certainty. There is a point of certainty. There is the theory of certainty. God has appointed that his way is in the presence 
of the Lord. His way is in the presence of the Lord. Now, you know, this verse really means something to me. Because for the last few months, in fact, I can almost say for the last year, God has been withdrawing one thing at another from my life. Even some friends that I, I'm not even close to anymore that I used to be close to. There's nothing between us. God has just withdrawn and drawn me away and shut me up to himself. In fact, uh, he just so shut me up to himself that I, I have no one to turn to but him. Now, don't, I'm not trying to get pity here. I'm just simply making us some statements that um, that God has so shut me up to himself that he's just been it. And he's all that it, there is. And for this last year, I've been seeking God. One day I'll tell the devil uh, he's defeated. And one day the devil will tell me I'm defeated. And one day the Lord will speak such peace to my heart that I'll be able to stand up and praise God that the devil is defeated. And, of course, my uh, uh, health is so improving that I feel so good that I want to get out and win the world. And then I next, then the next thing comes along the devil and says, listen, that won't last. And, you know, I have just been literally bombarded as to about, oh, God, which way, which way, which way? And I've been wanting to see the way. And right here, God has revealed the way, the certainty of God. He says, thy way, oh, God, is in thy presence. And there it is. If we are not knowing the way, if we do not know what to do about a given situation in a certain uh, circumstances, then my dear friends, we need to seek the presence of God. We need to seek His presence. And in His presence will be His way. In other words, we'll see His way. I got to thinking about this. And I, I, was, I got to thinking about back in 1970 and 71 when I was at the door of death. And I did not know the way. And friends, I, my friends would come and spend months praying. Months praying for me. And they, they would pray hours a day. And weeks at a time they would fast. And we didn't know the way. But I remember one night in January 1971 in the Holiday Inn downtown Chattanooga, Tennessee. But my friend, I got in the presence of Jesus. And the moment I got into the presence of Jesus, His way, I knew. I saw it. His way, I knew. Now what I'm saying to you today is this is a absolute, this is a certainty that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, is the way. And you as a believer in His presence, get into His presence, you will have the way. You will have the way. I think this is beautifully illustrated in Exodus, the 14th chapter. And in fact... Um, uh, this whole chapter, Psalm 77, tells us about how this is beautifully illustrated. And so, if you have your Bibles, and you're still where you can turn with me, turn back to the 14th chapter of the book of Exodus. And here's what you'll find. You'll find that the children of Israel has now moved out of Egypt with a cloud by day and a fire by night. And they are led to the Red Sea. That's amazing how God led these people to this problem. Some people have the idea God does not lead us to problems, but he does. And, of course, there are several reasons he leads us to problems, but he led these people to this problem. And as he led these people to this problem, now he, uh, he dealt with this problem by having Moses to stand up in, in the midst of the crowd because the crowd could look back and they could could see that the Egyptians were coming from behind to destroy them. The Red Sea was in front of them. They couldn't turn to the left or the right. They couldn't go forward. They couldn't go back. They were all shut up. And Moses stood up and uh, told the people not to fear, to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. 
He said, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. When I hear Moses declaring his faith, and I mean, friends, if a man ever put himself on the spot and declared a position of faith, this man did. Now, it's obvious that his faith was in God. But in the 15th verse of that 14th chapter, something uh, in is indicated here that something happened. He said, And the Lord said unto Moses, Why criest thou unto me? Do you see now? All at once he turns to God and starts crying unto God. But as God speaks, Moses is now in the presence of God. And as he's in the presence of God, God said, Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. You see, when Moses here declared his faith, It seems that all at once uh, he got shook and he turned to the presence of God. Oh God, thy way is in thy presence. And when he got to the presence of God, there was the way. (laughs) That's real interesting. That was the way when he got into the presence of God. And so, friend, I'm telling you today that uh, as he got into the presence of God, uh, the way was made plain. The way was made clear. And so I trust today that uh, as you're listening to this tape, that you'll realize thy way, O God, is in thy presence. Seek the presence of God. Seek his presence. Seek his presence. Now, let me say this about uh, the way of the Lord. He said that thy way was um, in the sea. And that's interesting because as you turn back, to Psalm 77 and look at that particular portion of scripture you'll find that he said thy way uh, is in thy uh, presence but not only that but he said that the way was in the sea look at it with me the 19th verse of Psalm 77 he says thy way is in the sea and thy path is in the great waters and thy footsteps are not known in other words The way of the Lord's leading is in the sea. Now, you know, the sea is an area where basically uh, there are no paths, there are no signs, there are no footsteps. And so uh, the sea is the way of the impossible here at this point. And so when the Lord, when we get into the presence of God, very likely his way will be a challenge and a charge And a commission for us to move in the area of the impossible. And it not only will be the impossible, but friend, it will be in the light that we will have to constantly depend upon the Lord. In other words, there's no markings that we'll have to depend upon Him for every step. We'll have to depend upon Him for every way, every turn. And that's where God wants us. God wants us right here. God wants us right here every day of our our lives. It's so good to to realize that God wants us here. I have come to believe in my heart that the real genuine sin of this day and in, in our time, the real genuine sin is the fact that we do not stay in a... Uh, absolute dependency upon the Lord. In other words, I believe, friend, that we are experiencing problems so uh, uh, real in our lives that we just throw up throw up in despair and just quit. Or we are uh, so blessed that we just simply forsake God. Uh, but we need to walk as the writer of the Proverbs uh, walked and prayed, Oh God, Make me uh, blessed enough, bless me enough that I will not steal. But let me be poor enough that I'll have to still depend upon you. The Lord told the children of Israel, he said, you know, said you're going to get in the land of Canaan and you're going to get so blessed that you are going to uh, forget me. You're going to forget me. And I, I believe today that uh, the, where the real battle with us as God's children really stand is in this place, friends. We do not know how to walk with God in the way whereby we can literally stay totally dependent upon Him. But I'll tell you what, we get in His presence, and He says His way is in the sea, and we start moving out in the impossible with God, 
and in and the impossible being in the sea. There's no other way but to simply trust Him. Our friends will get under. We'll get we'll get drowned. We'll get put under completely. We'll get lost. And so I believe that the way is not uh, only in His presence, but I believe it will be in the impossible. And I believe it will be where we'll have to depend on the Lord every day of our lives. Now, praise God for this. I, I tell you, I praise the Lord for uh, this particular truth. It has been so liberating to me to realize that, friend, when I do not know the way, when life is all muddled and it's all messed up and things are not right, what I need to do is get back into His presence. And so when I get back into His presence, then I find the way. Well, the question will come. You say, well, preacher, how in the world can we get into the presence of God? How can we make it? How can we make it? Well, I, I want to list several things that steps to getting into the presence of God. And one of the things that you and I need to know for sure is that the presence of God is available to us. By the sovereign grace of God, God has made himself available to man. Now, liberal theology would make you think that man is in quest for God. But fundamental theology will let us know that, my dear friends, God has taken the initiative. And the Bible is a revelation of God seeking for man. And it's a revelation of God having made provision whereby man uh, can be reached. And that the Holy Spirit has been sent to bring man to the truth. That God has made some provisions for man. And I say this to you. If you want to get into the presence of God, you've got to know that, friends, the the um, veil has been rent. That the Holy of Holies is open and available to you as a child of God. In other words, we need to know that the presence of God is there available to man. Now, that doesn't mean that man can go in at his whims without the proper condition met, but it does mean that God has made a vision whereby you and I can literally go into the presence of God. I mean, friends, God has made that provision through the death of through the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension, and the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have access to the throne of glory today. We have access to the presence of God. Praise God for that uh, availability of God. And he, he is available. He is absolutely available. And I'm not talking about some type of availability where man can... I go out here and do what he wants to and and uh, live like the devil and just flip into the presence of God by a uh, simple decision. But I am saying, my dear friends, God is available to reach man and deal with man whereby man can come into the presence of a holy God today. And that is absolutely true. Now, not only is there the availability of God, God's sovereign grace having made provisions for us whereby we can enter into his presence but in order for man to get into the presence of God man must be brought to a, an awakening of his need to the extent that the Lord is the only answer now man is awakened to his needs man has needs and he knows he has needs all the time but Man must be wake, awakened to the extent that he knows that the Lord Jesus, the presence of the Lord, is the answer to his needs. Now, I find that people all the time uh, are awakened to their needs. They're awakened to their needs to the extent that uh, they come see me even. And, uh, and then I tell them, I say, well, the Lord is the answer to your problem. And they get disappointed. They get upset. They get disturbed. When I tell them that the Lord, the presence of God, is the answer to their need, they get terribly upset. Now, so that man that comes to see me and stops anything less than the Lord has not been awakened to the fact that the Lord is the only answer to their needs. Now, I believe if a man's going to get into the presence of God, he must be awakened to the fact that the Lord is the only answer 
to his needs. Now, I go a little further. When a man knows that the Lord is the only answer to meet his needs, then man out of this will have to come to a change of mind about himself and about God. Now, very likely this will be a spontaneous result of the uh, two previous steps. But man must have a change of mind. He must have a change of mind. Now, the Bible refers to this as a state of repentance. A state of repentance. And uh, change of mind about yourself and about God. And, of course, about yourself that there's no hope. About God, that he's the only answer. Now, after man has come to that place where he has a change of mind about himself and about God, then uh, man can have that change of mind, but he still has to make the decision. God doesn't make the decision for it. But man makes the decision. The man must make a decision on the basis of the light he has about himself and the light he has about the Lord. And when a man turns to the Lord on this basis, as far as he's concerned, the Lord is Lord of all. And when he turns to the Lord as Lord of all, he has no reservations about the Lord being Lord of all. No, no reservations whatsoever. The Lord is all of it. That is called a complete act of consecration. And my friends, when man gets there then he can get into the presence of God. Now, the amazing thing about the presence of God, the presence of God will be uh, so obvious to a man. And I do not believe that uh, the presence of God will always be uh, revealed by emotional manifestations and sensations and so on. I believe the presence of God will be manifested in the sense of a a knowing in the spirit where man just simply knows he's in the presence of God and he's set free and there's just a naturalness and a flow in his life. And so, my dear friends, I I pray today that you will realize that the the veil has been rent. Jesus Christ opened the way to the Holy of Holies and that you can get into the presence of God regardless. You say, well, preacher, you don't know what sin I've committed, but let me tell you something. My friends, through the uh, fact that God has made it, made for provision in His Son, and through His Son, and by His Son, the veil has been rent, and through the precious blood of the Lamb of God, your sins can be covered. Through the cross of Calvary, yourself can be crucified and through simple surrender to God, you can be filled and fused with the, with the Holy Spirit and enter into the presence of God. And the presence of God will lead you, my dear friends, into that knowing God in the way that you can have your needs met today. And I trust today, I, I trust today that some way, somehow, some way, somehow, that God will definitely show you the way. Now, what I've said is this. If you're out there in your life, and I find that regardless of where we are along the pilgrimage uh, of the Christian life, uh, this life, uh, it just doesn't make any difference how mature we are. My dear friends, God allows us to come up to the Red Sea. Or He allows us to come up to the walls of Jericho constantly and my dear friends we are there and regardless of our spiritual growth uh, where we just left Egypt just got saved or where we just crossed over Jordan entered into Canaan it doesn't make any difference we are constantly faced with issues and we are constantly faced with not knowing the way my dear friends that fact that we do not know the way indicates that we are not in the presence of God and so I trust that today, some way, somehow, you will find yourself and get into the presence of God that you might see the glory of God. Amen. Well, it's been good to come to you again this month. I pray that this simple message will have a deep uh, impact on your heart. 
for some time, the Lord kept running me by this verse of Scripture, Psalm 77:13, And I kept looking at that, and it kept saying, Thy way is in thy sanctuary. And somehow I just could not get the message of it. But all at once, it began to break out on me. As I read, uh, some dear brother had... That word uh, sanctuary meant the presence of the holy presence of God. And I began to see the presence of God there. And I found that just in his presence. And to maintain just staying in his presence. Now, of course, you won't, you won't uh, become passive at this point. You won't become passive at all. In fact, you, uh, you'll find yourself that he's constantly saying uh, this way, this way this way, this way. But practicing the presence of God. Oh, my. May the good Lord bless you uh, as um, we sign off this time. And you pray that the Lord will uh, bless us with the uh, necessary strength, physical strength and and, uh, spiritual power and all the equipment that's necessary to really accomplish the end. God has laid out before us. Uh, We're trusting that His glory might rest upon your life in these days, that we might be mightily used of God in these last few minutes just before Jesus comes.